Hello, friends. Oh, a bit itchy there. Uh, welcome. Seeing people coming in. Just give people a chance to join us. Thank you, everybody who has made it down to join in with the live today. And also, if you're watching this on the playback, thank you as well for making the time to watch this on the playback. I am noticing that my internet is a little bit laggy. Um, we are having some internet problems currently where I live. So hopefully it won't be too bad and it will start to um, sort itself out. Fingers crossed. We will keep moving and see how we do. Let's get started with some hellos. Mickey, glad you made it from the start. Welcome. Good to have you here. Dorothy, good evening. Ready for we'll, um We may well be chatting about some ritual purposes. It is, after all, the history news. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Deborah. Hello, another Deborah. One Deborah after another there. Hello. Hi, Pretty Pick. Lovely to see you. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's just a big jump there. Shane. Happy birthday for this coming Wednesday. I hope you're going to have a lovely day. I hope you have some wonderful plans in store and that you're going to have a lovely time celebrating. Happy birthday indeed. It's people in some very warm places I'm seeing. Yes, it's sort of cooled down here, thankfully, because it was really over the top with the heat a few weeks ago. Now it's slightly less... Um, aggressively hot, which I'm quite pleased about. So once again, let's uh, start as we mean to continue. We have a history news. I have I have many, many topics that have been sent to me. So I do want to hop in that, so that we can get them underway and uh, make sure that we have plenty of time to discuss them. We do have some updates, some repatriation slash decolonization. We have new news. We have a ding dong and we also have some events and exhibitions as always these are all pasted in the opera pin board which is linked in the description box in addition you will notice that beneath the opera pin board link there is also a list of the articles that we are discussing today that list is helpfully numbered on the bottom of the slide as we go through and discuss you will see those at the bottom of the slide is also numbered so the number on the bottom of the slide coincides with the number in the list in the description box. So if you want to pair those things up, that is how you can do it. As always, I have had lots of people sending me articles um, for which I am incredibly grateful. So without further ado, let's hop in to have a chat about who I have to thank first before we get into the updates. Thank you to Catherine, Jesse my name twin cat, to Yvonne, Joseph, Mary. I didn't put those together, those names together on purpose, but I've just realised that that is Mary and Joseph. So, I mean, we're at the wrong time of year for it, unless perhaps you're having Christmas in July, maybe you're in Australia. To Verity, Kenny, Kate, Alicia, Beth, Carve Phelan, Perpetual Mourner, Carolyn, Jackie, Alberta, Miss Pretty's, Mrs. Pretty's Maid, Anne, Amy, Caitlin, and Pretty Pick. As always, it really does mean so much that you spot a history news item, that you take time out of your day, and that you send it to me. Um, <clears throat> once again, I am looking to streamline the process of receiving these news updates. I am in the process of building my website. And my husband thinks he has a plan as to how we can possibly coincide those two things to make the process of getting these news items and storing them and having a list of them much easier than it is currently. So hold fire on that. Thank you for your, the way you're sending them currently, either via, I'm mostly getting them via email and Twitter, but who knows what's going to happen with Twitter? So just in case... The email address is reading the past with Dr. Cat, all one word, at gmail.com. It is listed in my description box. It's also listed on all my social media in my link tree. Um, so if you do want to get in touch that way, um, that might be the best because who knows what's going to happen with Twitter. Mm. 
very secretive of you. <laughs> I hope that's okay for me to share. I just I suddenly went, oh, oh there you go. Um, welcome, Kenny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let us, oh, people are saying who they are. Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to hop into the updates. First update, we have a video. I, it was a couple of months back now, that shipwreck and the finds on it and the incredible fabric-based finds. Well, here we have a video. First link in the chain. Uh, and my goodness, what a thrill it is to see a moving image featuring the uh, clothing. So if you want to check that out, that is available. It is linked. How fabulous is that? Uh, next up, we have the news about that Brickell, Brickell? I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Brickell construction site following the discovery of prehistoric artefacts. The Miami City Board has voted to temporarily protect part of this uncovered prehistoric settlement. This vote took place on the Monday. Um, it was planned that it was going to be, the site was going to be developed, but the board said that it should be held off the development as it is now going to be a protected archaeological site. There, on this site, they found artifacts and fossils dating back thousands of years. So this vote that's happened now stops developers from doing any demolition or major building or getting permits for those things for at least six months. So let us um, see how that goes and hopefully they will get some useful stuff out of it. Pretty pick. Also a Dr. Cat, a semi-name twin, although you go by Katie. Ah, See, everyone I think assumes that I'm a Catherine, unless they're on my other social media, because I am a Katrina. So I, I don't ever respond to Kate, although people do accidentally call me Kate. Um, and I never never realise they're talking to me until I hear somebody just shouting Kate repeatedly. I'm like, oh, they probably mean me. But I've never answered to that. I am more likely to answer to Tweeny um, than I am to Kate. Uh, but yes, hello, another semi-name twin. You're a Kathleen. Ah, interesting. Hello, Kathleen. Next update. This is fabulous. This portrait is just chef's kiss gorgeous. This is the uh, Catherine Parr portrait that was auctioned at Sotheby's. It has shattered records, we are told. It went to a UK collector, so I'm assuming that means private collection, and it sold for $4.4 million, which was four times its initial high estimate. Now, the one thing I will say about this publication that we have there here is the way that they have started this paragraph. A rare portrait of Catherine Parr, 6th wife Henry VIII, and an accomplished woman in her own right. Correct. But that doesn't actually set her apart from many of Henry's other wives. They, the majority of Henry's wives were highly accomplished women in their own right. So I just, I feel like they, they are, they're sort of setting her aside there as being, I mean, yes, she did publish two books, which is very accomplished, but she is not the only accomplished wife. Henry is one of those special breed that likes his women incredibly articulate and intelligent and spicy until that spice gets directed towards him and then he gets the right old hump. I don't know what's going to happen to the uh, painting as it's going to private collection. Let's, let's hope that it gets rented out. The National Portrait Gallery has recently reopened, so maybe, maybe. Excellent point. They, they, you don't get to go to court without being accomplished. You absolutely don't. Um, that's yeah, F fully, fully agree with that. Um, we do know who painted this portrait. Let me, let me just double check because I, I thought I clipped it, but I didn't. Um, I thought I, I want to say that it's. Ewart, but I'm it might be Master John. 
I think it's Master John. Let me double check one sec. Bear with. <laughs> Bear with while I open up opera. Unless somebody can Google it quickly. I think it's Master John. Um, but interestingly, the badge she is wearing, the brooch at the top of her gown, is to my eye, and I'm by no means a jewellery expert, the same brooch that she is wearing in the full length portrait of her where she's on that turkey carpet. So I, I it's it's a very interesting choice because the brooch does include a crown, which means that she is a queen consort being uh, depicted wearing a crown, which is very uh, unusual in this time period. So I'm just opening it up. I have a... I, I absolutely agree. Let's hope this is not the last time we see it for 20 years. Indeed. I but Did I say Master John last time? Good. That, I think that rings a bell. Um, I think I would like to do a video on Master John because we talk, I've talked about Hans Holbein a lot. But there were, of course, much like, I suppose, Shakespeare, there were, of course, other artists. It, these These great talents don't exist in a vacuum so i think that's worth pointing out and Anne, you say you joined threads today i have also joined threads same hand as my instagram i like it it's not perfect this is the instagram threads thing that um space karen is going to is threatening to sue um facebook karen about uh the, it's it's not perfect but it, it i don't feel a sort of pulsating fury in the back of my eyes when i'm looking at it so there is there is that i think it's probably good for my better for my blood pressure put it that way to be on threads than on twitter because i just i used to doom scroll twitter i think we all did but now now i'm just <laughs> rage scrolling all the time because because of the foolishness that I see left, right and centre. Yes, um, Yvonne, if, the, if it had been bought by a museum, they would make it's, it's gone into a private collection. My hope is that the private owner is the sort of private owner who is prepared to loan it out frequently and in a wide ranging fashion principally because then they are in part this amazing work of art is in part being cared for on somebody else's coin and uh, under somebody else's insurance and uh, Dorothy in terms of the threads profile threads I'm assuming you're asking what threads is threads is Instagram's answer to Twitter they probably wouldn't like me saying that but that's what it is. It's a new social media platform. It's heavily linked to your Instagram. It does very much the same thing as Twitter does, but it's a bit more picturey, if if that makes if that makes sense. Yeah, look, I don't love the fact that Facebook was originally invented so that dudes could perv and rate their female cohort i don't love that it's gross but as you rightly say uh, twitter is it's a sewer and it makes me very sad and very anxious just double checking um this is rare portrait of henry the eighth's wife and it is Attributed to an unknown painter referred to as Master John. So, yes, M Master John is the painter. So I want to look into Master John, I think, and see and see what's going on there. Because in terms of and, and sort of unknown painter known as Master John, I think it's it's also worth saying that we don't know loads about lots of other painters, but it's it's uh, definitely worth investigating. Right, let us continue on. This is Vindolanda. We've got a couple of things from Vindolanda update wise. These are volunteer archaeologists have found evidence of uh, the ninth cohort of Batavians. 
This Vinterlander, which translates as White Field or White Moor, was a Roman auxiliary near Hadrian's Wall, which uh, these along it there were nine forts built of timber or stone at Vindolanda and they were there from AD 85 to 370 which we are told makes it one of the most complex archaeological sites in Britain. Vindolanda continues to be an ongoing active archaeological site at which has been found shoes, textiles, wooden objects, something called the Vindolanda tablets which we have talked about which is some of the oldest surviving documents in Britain. They have also found a copper alloy lion recently, a pommel, presumably a pommel for a sword or um, I'm just trying to, a gladius. No, that's not the word for it when it's for a centurion, is it? Or is it still a gladius? I'll double check that. This uh, dates to around AD 92-105. The soldiers that were based there at this time were a mixed infantry cavalry unit of around a thousand men that came from a region close to the mouth of the Rhine and and which is in the modern day Netherlands. I don't know what that means. I will investigate what rate limits mean, but thank you. I'm assuming that's a warning about something. I will check it. A gladius, yes, a gladius is a a short sword, so that would be, I'm assuming that's a pommel for a gladius then, I would think. They've also found a bone-handled knife that dates from around the same period, a sherd of a mortarian bow with indications that it was repaired using lead and copper alloy. They found a pit of waste including nuts, hazelnuts, and a Samian pottery depicting a hare. There is, uh, this is, we're at the start of a five-year excavation project on the site. They're going to be excavating something called Roman Magna. Sorry, Roman Magna. This is a fort that predates Hadrian's Wall. And the director of excavation, for the Vindolanda Charitable Trust, Dr. Andrew Burley says, quote, Magna has waited patiently for thousands of years to start to tell us its story and history, and that time is now. The project is vital as it comes at a time when the rapidly changing climate is having a devastating effect on the preservation of some of the most pressured, precious buried archaeological deposits. This threatens our future ability to explore and understand our past. So if Yes, yeah, a really good point. As climate alters, as rainfall alters, soil alters, it may become that it doesn't quite hold on to and protect finds in quite the same way. This is another, I've, I've got to say, it's cool, but I'm there's... This to me is it, it. It feels I find this unnerving, and I don't know why, because it is just a, like a statue of a hand. But there's something about it that makes me go, "Hey, I feel uncomfortable with this." Um, the appearance of it, I, the way it reaches out, makes it unsettles me. This is also a Vindeland, as I said. They have found this small child size, and as they point out, eerie lifelike. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the, it, it looks quite lifelike. It looks like it's reaching out towards something um, in a way that I find quite upset, unsettling. The hand, they say, as we can see, is very well crafted. That the, it's especially in the palm facing side, which indicates that its purpose was to do profile the object that it once held. The base of the hand is socketed and would have originally been fixed to a pole. Okay, so this was found, this this hand was found a few metres from a temple that was dedicated to Jupiter Dolly Canus. Um, And it it is incredible. So it's thought this hand most likely served a cult function so we're there already ritual purposes and that it was possibly associated with the 
that Jupiter Dolly Canis, a god and mystery cult. <laughs> Mystery cult. This is the new ritual purposes. We've got ritual purposes for a mystery cult. Fabulous. That was popular in the Roman Empire from the early to second, early second to mid third centuries AD. There is there is just a shade, isn't there, of the uncanny. Like that hand, even though it's obviously metallic, there's something uncanny valley about it. That you just said it. You uh, a but pretty yeah, unhandy valley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's what it is. That's what I think is disturbing about it. But what a cool find! What a cool find! And the Vinderland of finds are on display. So, um, and I and I'm assuming as more stuff comes out, that, that too will go on display. Our next update is about a ding dong. Last week's ding dong. This absolute clown. <laughs> That's me being polite and not doing a swear. What a fool he is. <laughs> Tourist who allegedly carved names into Rome's Colosseum says he, he didn't know the, quote, antiquity of the monument. Sir. So you just queued up because you will have queued up. You You will have queued up. There is there is no way that you thought you're like, oh, what's this? What's why haven't they bothered to build that back up? It's a bit weird, that isn't it? That it's all ruined. Have they not finished it? What do you think it was? A building site? What did you think it was a building site? He was well, I mean, he was proud of himself, wasn't he? He was filmed carving his name into the wall. Um, and he apparently has sent a letter of apology to the local prosecutor's office, in which he says, uh, quote. I admit with the deepest embarrassment that only after what regrettably happened was you didn't trip over, babe, did you? It regret it was a regrettable chain of events <laughs> in which I carved mine and my girlfriend's name into the mother loving Coliseum. <laughs> It was only after what regrettably happened that I learned of the antiquity of the monument. Absolutely not. Uh, apparently he scratched Ivan and Haley, 23. Haley, babe, leave. This is not, this is not where it, where it needs to go for you. I don't know. I don't know who you are, but you can do better. It's <laughs> Haley, go leave so they are hoping to, for a plea bargain and um the culture minister did say that the the military police the cabinary had identified the person presumed to be responsible for the uncivilized and observed act committed at the Colosseum, uh an act that offended everyone across the globe who appreciate the value of archaeology of monuments and of history this is the there's an apparent fine that he might be facing a fine of five thousand euros, which is about five thousand four hundred dollars, and he could face up to fifteen days in jail. The 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 public shame that you should feel. This is a he is a grown adult, livid, livid. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're loving me. I'm loving the uh yeah, this 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 guy is the he is this meme, he is the facepalm meme. He is in the dictionary definition of facepalm, this this dude. I I think he knew what he was doing. I, I agree, but I I do think he was unaware of how cross people were gonna be. I think he is probably surprised by the outpouring of absolute furious rage jesse i'm not going to put yours up on screen um but yes i <laughs> wholly agree wholly agree uh danny i i agree i think he, I, he's either lying to himself or to us but some there's deception happening there for for sure uh just wild to me wild 
he is from the UK. He is a fitness instructor and something else. He's a fitness instructor and something. Um, and he he's one of ours. We we claim him. We Venus. That means yeah, I get that. Thank God he's not American, but he's one of ours. So we're blinking well stuck with him. <sighs> Livid. Livid. Yeah. That it does sound like it does sound like his his uh, lawyers wrote it, and I'm also, yeah, criminal offensive side eye, bombastic side eye for this one. Yes, he he is Bulgarian, but he I he has I'm not sure if he, he has residency in Britain, so he 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 flew out from us to them, so it's he's he's our problem. <sighs> yeah, no, he's um. He's one of ours. Apologies, world. Brits abroad. What could you do, eh? Um, this update on the translator, Chinese language translator, whose work, whose translation work was used by the British Museum. She then called them out. Then they went, oh, it's our bad. We don't know how to reference other people's work this one. By all being academics and that being what needs to happen. Uh I I whoopsie daisy. Well, rather than make it right, what we'll do is we'll we'll pretend you were never here. <laughs> we'll just expunge you from the exhibition um on the person that you are doing all your academic work on. So, and I think rightly so, uh Yilin Wang has retained lawyers and threatened to sue the museum for copyright and moral rights infringement i'll be honest with you i don't know what moral rights infringement means i'm not a i have no law degree but she's doing this because the institution did not credit her translation and uh when they were then confronted they removed both english and chinese text rather than crediting and compensating the vancouver-based translator so that was an option then. That was... Okay. Um, the British Museum, quote, fully accept it made a mistake, has apologised to Ms Wang and sought to make amends financially, the institution said in a statement which it provided to the art newspaper. It said that it had, it had offered Wang £600 or $780 in compensation, benchmarked to what it described as, quote, industry rates. I don't I don't know if that's true. I suppose that will be for the courts to decide. I I, I honestly cannot tell you it, it, that that feels a little low. I'm just going to say because this is it's labor that is going towards an exhibition where I'm assuming the tickets are like 15 to 18 pounds. And obviously a lot of people need to be paid, but it is running for a while. And there's also an exhibition book which included the translation in it. So it's been republished in a publication as well that is available, I assume, worldwide. I'm assuming a lot. I'm going to say that here. I don't know if that's lowballed. I don't know. We're continuing on, the, the museum has not, however, reinstated the poems with credit to translation. So this is, I think, back pay, which, OK, maybe they've not added it so that they wouldn't have to pay going forward. Uh, a fundraising campaign has been launched by Miss Wang and it has raised £18,000 or $23,400. She wants the... Uh, work to be reinstated for the rest of the exhibition's run, run along with a appropriate credit and a modest payment for that. Okay, so it's not about the money. It should be, but I think it's it's about the uh, taking down her translations does feel really spiteful to me because what she wants is to be credited and receive reimbursement. Valid things. 
I don't see why the decision was taken to just go, well, we won't have the perms at all then. We won't have it. it, it, it to me, it comes across as, well, if you won't share your dollies with me, I'm taking all of my toys and I'm going home. That's what it that's what it feels like to me. Um, so she has hired John Sharples of the London firm Howard Kenny Kennedy LLP. Don't know, haven't heard of them, but I don't fortunately have to deal with lawyers because I don't find myself in trouble. Touch all of the wood. Um, but the suit has not yet been filed. So she has, she's threatened it. And, but the response is, the translations came down at Ms Wang's explicit request. There's been no engagement with the museum's effort to obtain their consent, the museum told the art newspaper. Uh, they said that they followed her wishes. Wang disputed the museum's claim on the crowdfunding page, arguing that her request was not that her work be removed from the exhibit, but, quote, to be removed unless I was properly remunerated and credited for their use. The current position is the worst possible outcome. The public are not only being denied the chance to see my translations and to know who wrote them, but also the chance to read Kui Jing's words, Kui Jin's words too, so the, the person who she's translated. The result is, oh, and this is a spicy factual statement, the result is that two female writers of colour have both had their work erased. We are not disposable. It is, this is a, I, I beg of the British Museum, who is doing your, who is doing your PR? Who, who is in charge of your crisis management? Because you, you need a new girl for that. You need a new lady or gentlemen, a whole team. You need new people because they are absolutely ruining it for you. <laughs> this is wild to me. Um, if the case proceeds, Wang to court, Wang has said that she would donate 50% of any financial damages earned to start a mentorship programme supporting people of colour translating Chinese poetry. Wowzers. Brilliant. Um, I don't want it to go to court for her sake. But at the same time, I would like the scholarship. I think court would be a really laborious and stressful and traumatic process. I think court generally is. I think her case deserves to be heard, but I don't really want that for her. I want her to be free to do the incredible work that she's doing and to not be sidelined by the failure of an institution that, frankly, by now should be doing better. This is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Um, Wang's lawyer has said, quote, my experience of working with artists, writers and other creatives is that the worst and most dangerous thing anyone can do to them is to leave them feeling unheard, dismissed and disrespected. And that is what exactly what the British Museum has done here. Um, Wang is, uh, is hopeful not only for a positive outcome in her case, but the dispute will help raise awareness Around, about the poet in question's remarkable biography. She is apparently sometimes called the Chinese Joan of Arc. And I'll be honest, I'd never heard of her until this, uh, this conflict had begun. So she fought for women's rights and ran a school for would-be revolutionaries fighting against the Qing, Qing dynasty. Um, she was beheaded in 1907 when she was just 31. Wang said on Twitter, quote, the British Museum should absolutely fix things. But I think there's also an opportunity here for another museum to do an exhibit on Kwai Jen and to do it properly. It's a, it's a bad look. It's a, it's a bad look. And that's, a, and that's a really good point as well. The legal precedent this would set. Because. And what it would mean for plagiarism to be actionable. This is, I mean, of course, it's, it is plagiarism and it is copyright infringement and all of the rest of it. There's, there are, this is, there, there, the test cases exist. This interesting. Yes, she did suggest that the translation be taken down if she weren't compensated. But that's that is what happens when somebody has 
started a conversation without taking legal advice. I what it was very obvious that what she actually wanted, and she seems to have made it clear that what she actually wanted was for the work to remain up and for her to receive proper credit and um, compensation. Because saying you either pay me or you take it down, I if I was in her position, an exhibition at the British Museum that's already open with translations that have gone into the guidebook for that exhibition, saying take it down, either compensate me or take it down. No one in their right mind would think, oh, well, the British Museum is going to rip out that part of the exhibition. I would have been baffled, as I think she is. It's, uh, it's, it's no, no, it's a no for me. Museums and public institutions like to charge the public and also some materials that they loan should they not pay out when they loan work from others. They, they, they should. This is, this is correct. <laughs> that is absolutely what should happen. Absolutely. We have a happy news about a repatriation. Dutch museums are going to be returning artefacts that were looted from Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Look at this. Gorgeous cannon. This is called the Cannon of Candy with a K. Silver, wood, gold, and rubies. It is among items that were looted during the colonial period uh, operated by the Netherlands. It's going to be returned to Sri Lanka. Isn't it a beautiful object? I'm not entirely sure how big it is. It's, it's gorgeous, regardless. So there's this is there's a planned restitution of 478 cultural objects. Uh, you want to. So she has um, I have linked her. I have linked her Twitter in my opera pin board. So her Twitter, I'm assuming, will have her funding page on there. The Crowd Justice, I'm assuming it will be linked there. So if you want to go and check that out, then she's on Crowd Justice. Alternatively, I don't know if I don't know, I'm not familiar with Crowd Justice, whether you can search by her name, which is Yilin Wang spelt Y Yankee uh, Igloo Lima Igloo November. That's how you do those alphabets, isn't it? Uh, and then it's uh, W-A-N-G, Wang. Uh, so I don't know if that's how you search Crowd Justice, but her Twitter is linked if you want to check that out. And oh, in the, the article also, as you say, has a link to her legal fund. Uh, yes, it mentions it, certainly. And it does look like it's a clicky link. So those would be the places to go to. Um, so we have 478 cultural objects that are planned to be restituted. Oh, my husband's just got India, not Igloo. <laughs> Hotel India. <laughs> correct. That's correct. That's correct. I tell you why. It's because on number plates, you don't tend to have the letter I. Um, and the way I learned the alphabet was when I was helping out in my family's car dealership and uh, garage, the kind of workshop. I, I learned the alphabet from number plates. And because I isn't on there very often, <laughs> I forgot that it was India, not Igloo. <laughs> i sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so we are being told that, quote, this is a historic moment it is the first time that, based on the advice of the Advisory Committee on the Return of Cultural Objects from Colonial Context, they should have thought of a shorter name for that. That is big. We are returning objects that should never have been in the Netherlands. Quite right. Uh the committee was set up in 2022 to assess requests by countries for restitution of artefacts in state museum. It is considering more restitution requests from Indonesia, Sri Lanka and Nigeria. This cannon of candy is a ceremonial weapon made of bronze, silver and gold inlaid with rubies. The barrel is decorated with the symbols of the king of candy. So a sun, a half moon and a Sinhalese lion. This has been in the collection of the Rijksmuseum since 
1800. It was lo- believed it's believed to have been looted by the Dutch East India Company during the siege and plunder of Kandy in 1765. The director of this museum said that the re- decision to return the cannon and five of the pieces was, quote, a positive step in cooperation with Sri Lanka. There's a planned ceremony that actually took place on July the 10th to officially hand over looted artefacts to Indonesia, which is going to be taking place in Leiden, including a collection of jewels known as the Lombok treasure that was looted from Lombok Island. A rare Maori sail is on loan from the British Museum uh, and I will be talking about the exhibition that's in at the very end in events and exhibition, but it's going to Christchurch in uh, Aotearoa uh, and then it's going to be heading to the Auckland Museum in October. It was it arrived carefully rolled up. Uh, they, in the exhibition, we are told that it's, there was a three-day uh, wanega. I'm not 100% sure what that means, but it enabled people to, quote, get up close and personal with this five-metre-long sail. The British Museum gave permission for people to touch the delicate weave, and uh, which we are told is, is incredible that that was allowed to happen. However, and as somebody pointed out, perhaps the reason why the British Museum has been so uh, accommodating, quote, no tribal providence was found, so the piece would be returned to the British Museum, with whom the research team's strong relationship made the loan possible. So essentially, they were quite happy to let it go when they were pretty much assured that there was going to be nobody in the place it was going to that could lay claim to being uh, its rightful possessor. There is a mystery of how it came into British hands. Well, I mean, I think for the fair assessment is that it not, not, <laughs> maybe gently, on the balance of probability, probably not. But it does sound, it's it's the speculation that it came back with Captain Cook's collection in the 1700s. This design, we're told, involves immense ecological knowledge, delicate strands less than five millimetres wide. We're told that it's amazing and beautiful. The exhibition in question opened opens on Saturday and there's going to be events at the gallery over the weekend. So we'll be talking more about that and I have got links for um, all of it. And I think the thing is that it's not that they, they don't know which community or group are the rightful possessor. So thus, if no one has uh, an authenticated claim to it, it it becomes, you know, the baby that can be split in half. If if you know what it mean, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and no, at no point is this a drinking game because with the ritual purposes, mystery cults, and now um, British Museum looks like morally questionable, all of your livers will fall out. So <laughs> I don't support that message. We have got the repatriation. Switzerland sending this back to Egypt. This is a fragment from the statue of the Pharaoh Ramses II. It's, it's more than 3,000 four years old and it was confiscated in Geneva as part of uh, criminal proceedings. This stone sculpture was handed over to the Egyptian embassy in Bern on Monday by the director of the Federal Office of Culture. Its return is in accordance with the law on international transfer of cultural property. And we are told that this uh, restitution underlines the joint commitment of Switzerland Egypt to combat the illicit trade in cultural property, which was strengthened in 2011 by entry into force of a bilateral agreement on the import and return of cultural property. Both of these countries are party to the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which prohibits and prevents the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultural property. 
Egypt, we know full well, has been hit hard by the looting and destruction of archaeological sites. The objects at risk range from everyday objects to religious or ritual objects, such as funerary offerings, statues, and other architectural elements. Now, when I first saw the picture um, on the black background, I thought I was looking at something probably the size of a thumb. But then I've seen the person working on it at the far end, and it's a big lad. It's a big boy. So we are talking about a Virginia museum that repatriated a Nigerian sculpture and received a high-tech replica in return. Could the exchange shape the future of restitutions? Yes. Yes. Because as I have said many, many times, people who visit museums don't care about replicas. They don't. They are particularly of large, large scale objects. Maybe they feel differently about paint. They don't want to copy, maybe. But when it comes to things like, for example, the most famous dinosaur, certainly in England, maybe in the British Isles, is Dippy the Dinosaur of Natural History Museum fame. Everyone knows Dippy. Most people have got a picture with them by Dippy on a school trip or something like that. I, in fact, took home a statue of Dippy with flesh reattached. Dippy was an integral part of everyone's childhood. Dippy, there are about five Dippies worldwide. They are casts of the original skeleton. And even then, it's bits and pieces of different dinos put together, I believe. No one minds about that. You rarely find uh, entire skeletons of dinosaurs or, sorry, fossils of, of dinosaurs. So where you see a full fossil of a dinosaur, take, for example, a stegosaurus, like the one they have in the Natural History Museum, many of those bone pieces have been, are cast from other bones to make up a full fossil. We are very used to seeing casts all the time, all the time. Right, I did say, I thought it was the size of my thumb, but then I look at the image across and it's a big lad. <laughs> it's a, I, I didn't, do you know what? Do you know what? Correct. And look, I definitely get that. I, 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 if, if and when, please, the Parthenon marbles go back where they belong, having statues and replicas in their place i i do wonder about that however the exhibition or where they re it was the met wasn't it and then it came traveled where they put in um replicas and recolorized them and painted them the way they would have been painted using those replicas that's the thing about the replicas is there's stuff you can do with it and experiments you can do with it that you can't do with existing things in museums so for example the heads the the bust of roman emperors that we we pretty much know were heavily painted and decorated uh they having a cast of that having a replica of that would give us the time to experiment with with the appearance of it and the experience of seeing many of those things fully colored and highlighted would be really cool i think I've not got to good quick. I've not got to think about Elizabeth yet. We're still we're still on repatriations. I'm gonna I'm gonna start motoring through though because we've been here a while. Um, so we have this is f the Factum Foundation has been digitally recording the Beckor monoliths and producing facsimiles of them since 2016. The aim is to pilot a new model of restitution to quote show how digital technologies can be used to share objects so that repatriation was not necessarily a zero sum game. It, 
this time it really was wonderful to be able to send the original back and the facsimile to the international collection. Lots of these communities thank me when one of the monoliths is brought back in facsimile form. But the original has the spirit of their ancestor inside the stone. So they can do a facsimile of their ceremonies, but it won't be the real thing. Recording these monoliths has also had the positive effect of making them much harder to steal and sell illegally. We have them in every dimension photographed. It is a visual record. The next step for this foundation is to submit the sites of the Bacon monoliths to UNESCO for World Heritage Site status, which would help to protect them further from damage that is associated with deforestation. So... Interesting. Uh, this uh, happy faced man has spent decades collecting dozens of Ho Chunk Nation artifacts. There are 200 year old portraits, hand woven baskets, carved wooden tools. Apparently, this was an interest born out of his childhood, and he had two parents who were collectors. But now he's 89 and he's wondering what he should do with cultural materials that don't belong to his culture. Um, and he believes that they, they now belong with the nation. Um, so uh, 4th of May, there was an article about the installation of the Ho-Chunk clan circle sculpture at UW Madison. And this got this gentleman off the fence. So he decided to offer the pieces to the Ho-Chunk Nation Museum Cultural Centre. Um, he met with... Casey Brown, who we can see here, uh, who reviewed the collection. Apparently, he wants assurances, not not Casey, um, the other guy, that uh, as much as you can, they would be displayed, that people would see them. It's good of you to be making demands. Well, well done. That's the way this should work. Uh, he and the museum are still working out what items Spengler will donate. So they're not all up for grabs. It's going to be a, it's going to be a pick and choose. Um, but the collection is extensive, apparently. Uh, among the items is uh, an original group of McKenney and Hall lithographs of significant tribal figures from the 1840s. These portraits have apparently been in Spengler's family for decades, but their history goes back to 1824 when Thomas McKenney was appointed the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a position created for him by the War Department Secretary John Calhoun. Uh, in his six years as head of the Bureau, McKinney played a key role in the forced assimilation of Native Americans. So it's, it's, got a, it's got a super, super nice history there. F fabulous. I, yeah. So, it, yeah. So it's a little bit like, um, thanks for doing it, but also don't make demands. One and two, um, give it all back. Also, if we're gonna if we're gonna be playing this game, two 10th century stone idols, which were stolen from a temple in India, are have been found in a garden shed in the UK. Because where else would they be? These were. Recovered from an Englishwoman's garden shed, they are going to be returned to the Indian government during a special handover ceremony at the High Commissioner of India in London on August the 15th, which is India's Independence Day. The, we have, these are statues of two female deities that were looted between 1979 and 1982 from uh, a, a temple in Uttar Pradesh. It's thought that they were taken by an illegal smuggling network. Um, um, because these things were easy to steal as they weren't locked up. Well, they are working moments of worship. They were recovered in March after an Englishwoman sold the contents of her garden shed wholesale to a salvage company. They'd initially planned to sell the statues, but first decided to investigate their provenance. Um, they were soon referred to Chris Marinello, who is an American lawyer who founded the Art Recovery International in London in 2013. Chris Maranello, another hero for us. So it's a, it's a good time. Uh, he is, they matched these two images from the temple and because these are things have been photographed that were then lost, stolen. They were, we are told, usually worshipped as part of one large group, mostly of 64 
yoginis. This talking about the guy before. No, it's not better for them to leave and his descendants to dispose of on eBay. It's certainly not. But what would be even better is if he wasn't picking and choosing which ones he handed over, if he realised that they should all be handed back. And on top of that, not make demands, I think. Well, these are, we are told, quote, it's plausible that 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 was doing a lot of work that the original possessions became aware these were looted once they tried to sell them christopher maranello told artnet news mentioning this case had be that this had been the case for the yogini that surfaced in 2021 rather than returning cooperating and returning them they could have simply tried to hide them away to avoid legal issues he also commended the due diligence of the salvage company quote some dealers don't want the headaches and that is just wrong the salvage company in this case was an upstanding member of the art community who was willing to put morality above profit making fabulous last um repatriation news italy is calling on the louvre to repatriate seven ancient artefacts of questionable provenance. They were acquired by the museum between 1982 and 1998 from dealers that allegedly trafficked in stolen material. In February, the Italian culture minister met with the Louvre president to discuss the objects. Among them is this black 5th century amphora, which is attributed to the famed Berlin painter. Also, several Greek vases that are create, were created between the 4th and 6th centuries BCE. Quote, I consider that works of doubtful provenance are a stain on the collections of the Louvre. We should acknowledge and examine them with rigour and lucidity and speed. <laughs> rapidity also. Rapidity is also be diligent, but be quick. <laughs> um so we are we are told the museum is now investigating the provenance of the objects in question and could return them as soon as this year if they are indeed to have been um, proven to have been unethically sourced. But cases of restitution are not always simple in France because once they, like us, objects run by state-owned institutions are deemed inalienable, inalienable uh, meaning that removing them requires special approval from Parliament. Last year, former Louvre director uh, was charged with facilitating the acquisition of illegally trafficked antiquities by the Louvre Abu Dhabi. We talked about this on, on one of the sh these shows previously. Representatives for the Louvre have been, they did reach out for comment, but there was not a immediate return request or a response to the request for comment about this repatriation application. <laughs> yeah, with interest. <laughs> with TikTok, that's the sound of your cash running out. <laughs> then, of course, you've got to get them to pay. There's, there's that. That's the fun thing. I, I, I do think though that uh, if you, there is going to come a point because I am seeing a general groundswell of celebration when repatriations happen. And I'm also seeing increasingly a, a shared collective. And I'm, I'm witnessing this in museums that I'm in, in heritage sites that I'm in, when I'm talking to members of the public. There is, first of all, a question I'm, I'm often asked in various places is, is, how do we have this? That's a question. Ten years ago, I was never asked that question. Five years ago, I wasn't asked that question. I'm being asked that question regularly now. Where did this come from? How do we have it? And it's it's a it's a it's a query. People want to know. That's new. Um, people are much more au fait with the sticky fingers of people in the past. So yeah, the the ethical considerations of people who've who've bought tickets, I'm seeing. So. I think there's a sea change. And I also think that with that groundswell, there is an element to which the institution, I said, I've said this before many times, the institutions that fail to respond, the institutions that are on the back foot, the institutions that feel like they have an inalienable right 
to have things because finders keepers or possession is nine tenths of the law or whatever other nonsense they want to spout. What's going to happen is countries where they are fully throwing themselves behind repatriation and countries that are requesting repatriation, which think a growing number are going to stop doing business. They're going to stop collaborating. They're going to stop loaning. They're going to stop having traveling exhibitions going over there. And to be clear, there was stuff planned before the Brexit vote came in with museums in Europe and Britain. I know this because I was researching for one of them that would have been phenomenal. But the funding went away for it to come here. And so these institutions continuing to not act collaboratively and collegiately with people who are saying that stuff's ours, give it back, is we have we are getting we're getting less legs to stand on, is what I'm gonna say. And yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna end I don't think it's gonna end well for the institutions here, put it that way. And we will be the poorer for it. Ultimately, we can keep all of the shiny stuff that we stole uh, a century ago, whatever, two centuries ago. We can, if, if that is, if it really means that much to these institutions, keep it. But we will end up the poorer for it. And quite right. In the end, it's the, the public and the scholars who will be hurt by this. They will not be welcome at other institutions. There will not be uh, cross pollination of ideas. And it might feel like heritage in the museum sector is, you know, old, dusty stuff, but it's a we're seeing with people exploring stuff, it's a constantly evolving situation of technology. We we cannot afford to be left behind. So much of our income is tourism. We are told in, in the UK time and time again that the royal family are an in quotes great thing because it drives tourism. So do our museums. And if something isn't done to make them competitive and a place that other institutions want to work with, trust and believe it will not be long before it feels like they are 20 years behind every other museum uh, of, of a comparable size. My opinion. My opinion. Anyway, let's hop on to the new news. A discovery of 25 Mesolithic pits in Bedfordshire has astounded archaeologists. These, these are, have been found in Linmere and they are 12,000 to 6,000 years old. It's giving us clues about the ways in which our hunter-gathering ancestors may have survived. Archaeologists from the Museum of London Archaeology who are conducting the research said, quote, this date makes the site incredibly significant because there are very few Mesolithic sites in the UK that are this substantial. Evidence from this period is often slim, only consisting of flint tools and occasional butchered animal uh, remains. The expert from Southampton University, Professor Josh Pol Joshua Pollard, said, quote, while we know of other large and enigmatic pits, enigmatic pits, what a great term, dug by hunter-gatherers from elsewhere in Britain, including at Stonehenge, the Linmere pit are striking because of their number and the wide area they cover. This site has been explored as part of two separate development projects. So uh, Albion Archaeology worked on one area and the Museum of London Archaeology excavated the other. They found in the pits animal bones, uh, the remains of aurochs, which are a wild species of cattle with evidence that people had ate them. The archaeologists have wondered whether these pits were used in hunting or storing food, but they don't think so now because of their shape and size. They are considering why they were laid out in a number of straight lines up to 500 metres long while other Mesolithic pits are dug in alignments in Britain, the Linmere alignment seemed to be linked to former stream channels. Interesting. Um, so they are suggesting the effort required to construct these pits, their alignments and their locations next to water might have some spiritual or special significance. So I need to get another bell because ding, 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 we're going on virtual purposes. We are told that during this Mesolithic period, 
Ice sheets covering much of the country retreated and sea levels rose, cutting Britain off from mainland Europe. This was a crucial time of transformation in the UK's past, and studying a site where people made such a mark on the landscape could have far-reaching impacts on how archaeologists understand these ancient communities. It's thought there may be further pits that could be found in the area, and <clears throat> archaeologists are still analysing the finds in the lab. They want to know if these pits were dug at the same time and understand more about the plants that were growing nearby. We are told, quote, the work will reveal the environment these people lived in and hopefully answer the question, what were these pits for? Talking about big boys. It's, look at this big lad. Look at it. 300,000 year old giant prehistoric hand axes found in Kent. Uh, archaeologists from the University College of London have discovered this in this at an Ice Age site in Kent in England. This was made in advance of the development of the Maritime Academy School. They revealed Ice Age sediments on a hillside in the Medway Valley. And among this collection of finds are two giant, and they aren't joking, hand axes. I'm loving the puns about pits. Just want to put that out there. I'm seeing them. I'm enjoying them. Do carry on. Um, among this collection of finds are two giant hand axes made from flint. And these are, we are told, among the largest stone tools from the Paleolithic period found in Britain. They, I mean, look at what she's holding there. It's blinking enormous. The largest of the axes, at hand axes measures 29.5 centimetres in length. It's a big boy. Um, these hand axes are so big, we're told, that it's difficult to imagine how they could have been easily held and used. Perhaps they fulfilled a less practical or more symbolic function than other tools. A clear demonstration of strength and skill. So potentially ritual purposes. And certainly large ritual swords are a thing. Dr. Matt Pope said, quote, a programme of scientific analysis involving specialists from UCL and other UK institutions will now help us to understand why the site was important to ancient people and how these stone artefacts, including the giant hand axes, helped them to adapt to the challenges of ice age environments. So these excavations did also uncover a Roman cemetery that uh, and this may have been the burial site for a suspected Roman villa that was located 850 meters from the south. In this burial site, they found the remains of 25 individuals, 13 of which were cremated, in addition to collections of pottery and animal bones. Nine of the buried individuals were found with goods, including personal items, including uh, bracelets, and four were buried in wooden coffins. I think they this I saw some suggestion that this large hand axe may have been in, there's that some are suggesting that it may have been used in butchery. I am sure that more information will come out. Humans were in South America at least two twenty five thousand years ago. We are being told here because of the discovery of giant sloth bone pendants. This is humans were living in Brazil earlier than previously thought. Um, so this is an ex this is bones from an extinct giant ground sloth that were crafted in dependence by ancient people. Discovered in the Santa Elena rock shelter in central Brazil, three sloth osteoderms, bony deposits that form a kind of protective armour over the skin of animals such as armadillos have been found near stone tools and these sported tiny holes that only humans could have made. Finding This finding is among the earliest evidence for humans in the Americas and this is according to a paper that was published in the journal titled Proceedings of the Royal Society B. I think it's a hand axe because it doesn't have a handle. An axe has a handle, a hand axe, you hold it and like, 
You're the handle. <laughs> That's my hand gesture. <laughs> I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to show it, but you're the handle. Your arm's the hand your hand's the handle a bit. And a hugely exciting and rare Neolithic polishing stone has been found in Dorset. At first glance, this looks like a rugged boulder, correct? But there is they have found a smooth, glossy dip in the stone that indicates that some it's something very special. This is a vanishingly rare polishing stone used 5,000 years ago by Neolithic people to hone tools such as axes. This one was found by chance as volunteers cleared scrubland to expose sarsen stones that have been hidden by vegetation over the decades. The Jim Rylett got there first and sold, saw the boulder. Quote, it's a relatively unprepossessing boulder on one side, but then he flicked away some leaves and saw this shiny, polished area. Quote, it's safe to say I was surprised. <laughs> the only other one found in situ in England was found in the 1960s in Wiltshire. And by in situ, this, is, this stone is deep into the ground. It's got this glossy surface. Stone axes were used by the early farming people of the Neolithic to clear woodland and build houses and monuments. There's evidence that many stone axes were moved around widely in prehistoric times, possibly traded as part of exchange systems or carried by their owners from different sources where the stone was quarried. Um, so after the discovery of this polishing stone, the area around it is now subject to excavation and specialist analysis to see if any traces of the makers of stone axes are still present. Sa Sasha Chapman, inspector of ancient monuments at Historic England, said, quote, this is a hugely exciting and rare discovery <clears throat> in this little understand histor understood historic landscape, which is giving us an opportunity to explore the use of the stone and the communities who were using it. So these polishing stones, we're told, can be earth fast or portable, with many being found in France. And in fact, the name they go by is a French name that I'm not going to try and pronounce, but you can read it. It means polishing stone in French. But, um, I'm, you know, worst comes to worst, I get my husband up to read it. But that is the name and that's why it's got a French name. This next one. Just turn it, you know, have a look at this. Have a look. Right. When I first saw this, I thought, well, they've done something to that picture. They've colorized it they've they fiddled with it they've put that on there no no from everything and i'm willing and happy to be corrected corrected on this but i think that this is the color of this find like it actually looks like this and maybe it's the light or whatever but a norwegian dad hiking with his family has discovered a rock face covered with bronze age paintings um, and we see here rock paintings, Norway. This is just outside of Oslo, uh, and it's it's just in, it's incredible. I I genuinely was like looking at it, going, has this been altered with a filter? But it seems it seems not. So he took out his phone. Phone, took a picture and then put that picture into an app that could clarify if the markings were natural pigments such as iron deposits or something altogether more interesting. He saw this scene of figures and animals and so he contacted a local archaeologist. I mean, it seems like he's got some great friends. He said, quote, we were enjoying a little snack of juice and biscuits on a Sunday when I saw something red on the side of the rock. I took a picture and went into the app I had something like an out-of-body experience. I didn't really think it could be anything. These paintings include depictions of rowers and standing human figures. They are the first to have been found in this coastal area, um, but this precise location of it is being kept secret to uh, in order to protect them. How fabulous are they, though? 
we're staying with the Bronze Age. We've got a golden hair ring and also Britain's oldest wooden comb found in a Bronze Age burial. These are 3,000-year-old objects. They have been found in Wales. This, this comb is the oldest wooden comb ever found in the UK. They, although the gold ring is the most eye-catching, we are being told that the comb is the most significant. Eight narrow teeth remain on the comb, wood and other, because wooden and other organic materials usually decompose rapidly. So the fact that it was burned as part of a cremation might have saved it from disintegrating completely. Uh, until now, the oldest wooden comb found in Britain dates to between 140 and 180 AD. The fine gold ring, which measures less than half an inch, and we are told displays, and we can see, displays an expertly crafted gold chevron and herringbone pattern. Uh, and it's thought it might have served to bedazzle hairstyles. At the time, researchers have, researchers have said the use of gold for the ring could indicate the high social status of the deceased. Incredible. What an amazing thing. Good question. Unclear from the reporting or and from the image. Don't don't know whether it's decoration or for combing. If I find out more, it will be in the updates. Good question. Very good question. We've got a Bronze Age golden talk found in a field near Mistley. This is a 3,000 year old fragment that was found in Essex. Uh, we are the finds liaison officer said, despite it being made of prehistoric gold, quote, it could have been made yesterday, which is mind blowing. It's the first ever talk to have been reported as treasure from Essex. Gold metalwork from the Bronze Age is rare in Essex. So it's 3,000 year old. The detectorist who found it reported it to the Portable Antiquity Scheme three years ago, which it has to, that's the law. The British Museum experts confirmed that it was made from at least 75% gold and about 18% silver and some copper. It was crafted from a rectangular rod with four grooves cut into it. And uh, it would have been made by a highly skilled goldsmith who knew how far it could be twisted and when to stop so it didn't essentially sh um, shear off. The hope is that Colchester Museum will acquire this piece. Colchester has a big Roman collection. If it does, when this goes on display, this will, of course, be in the updates. A high-status ancient Spanish tomb held an ivory lady. This is the highest status individual in ancient Iberian copyright society that has been found and it was pre previously believed that the burial was of a male but instead now new study has said that it's actually a woman. This is a treasure packed tomb outside Seville and it dates back to 2850 BCE and it was thought that it contained a young man of between 17 to 25 years old but new techniques have shown that actually it's a woman and they have called her ivory lady because she was buried with ivory tusks ostrich eggshell and a rock crystal dagger they detected her sex using a new technique that identifies chromosomal information in tooth enamel we are told that this is uh, highly reliable even with poorly preserved human skeletons and this novel method is much cheaper than DNA testing. I'm wondering as well if it's um, co would cause less damage to the remains. We are told that when we compare the ivory lady to the people of her time, she stands head and shoulders above them. So we do not hesitate to, st to say that she was the most socially prominent person of her time. And this is, of course, remarkable because the remains are female. As well as containing a high number of valuable goods the grave is also a rare example of a single occupancy burial another sign that it belonged to somebody of very high status all of this work has been detailed in the journal scientific reports fascinating that's very kind robert thank you thank you for staying and watching
I mean, it, that's it. Seems like what that would make some sense that she was some obviously a person of of prominence and respect. Hopefully, we'll find out more. Burial tombs in Cyprus have been found that are full of precious artifacts. This is uh, in the it's on the southeastern coast of Cyprus, and these tombs date from fifteen hundred to thirteen hundred BCE. Professor Peter Fisher from the University of Gothenburg said, "Quote." It is reasonable assumption that these were royal tombs, even though we don't know much about the form of governments, governance that was practiced in the city at this time. The site was discovered using magnetometers. I don't know how you pronounce it. A device used for measuring the Earth's magnetic, magnetic field in geophysical surveys. I know about that from Time Team Geophys uh, to detect magnetic anomalies of various types and to determine the dipole moment of magnetic materials. Those were words. They were in an order. Um, some of you may know what that meant. Dipole. I'm good, good for you. Um, so they compared a site where broken pottery had been ploughed during farming with the magnetometer map. They showed large cavities one to two metres below the surface. They said us to continue investigating the area and to discover the tombs. We continue on. These they consist of underground chambers, each measuring up to four by five meters, accessed via a narrow passageway from the surface. In the chambers, they found over 500 complete artifacts. So, this is precious metals, gems, bronze weapons, ivory, high status ceramics, and a gold framed seal made of hematite. Wowsies. Um, these these tomb contents would have been imported from neighbouring cultures and civilizations. So gold and ivory from Egypt, the precious stones from Afghanistan, India and Sinai, while other objects come from the Baltic region. They also found well-preserved skeletons, including a, a woman who was found surrounded by ceramic vessels, jewellery and a bronze mirror. Professor Fisher, quote, several individuals, both men and women, wore diadems and some had necklaces with pendants of the highest quality, probably made in Egypt during the 18th dynasty at the same time as pharaohs such as Tutmos III and Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I don't think we've got muons in this one. Um. I'm very glad you like it. And uh, congratulations on your summer break and have a wonderful time at Hampton Court. There is, if you're if you're around, then August the 1st to 6th, I want to say, Hampton Court is having a joust. It's always a good time. Love a bit of jousty. And high status Iron Age burial found in Hallstatt. This is in Austria. Uh, Hallstatt is apparently known for its production of salt, dating back to prehistoric times. I was not aware of that, but now I know. And it gave its name to the Hallstatt culture. This is a people that emerged during the late Bronze Age. The, the burial they found is situated in an Iron Age cemetery that was first found in 1846. Recent excava excavations, however, have found a burial pit containing a cremation grave and well-preserved bronze objects, including a ribbed arm ring, spirals of thin wire, possibly from a fibula brooch, a bronze blade with traces of the wooden handle, that's incredible, and a piece of iron lead that's been identified as a belt fitting. The artefacts that were found were intentionally broken or bent and placed alongside the remains of animal bones and food residue. According to the researchers, the intentional damage of metal work was a ritual offering and may have been an expression of uh, the death of the buried individual. Several spiral discs were discovered, which is what we're seeing in that picture, and upon close examination, they have, the team found 
traces of preserved fabric. Researchers suggest that the burial was placed in a textile bag and the spiral disc deposited on top, revealing for the first time a new and distinct burial practice of the Hallstatt culture from the Iron Age. Hopping to Egypt and new technology, chemical imaging, cutting edge technique, we're told. This is chemical imaging reveals details hidden in Egyptian paintings. This cutting edge technique has been used to find hidden details in two ancient paintings that date back more than 3000 years. They use portable chemical imaging technology and doing so allowed research to identify alterations that were made by artists in that are rare in Egyptian paintings, which were commonly thought previously to have been highly formalised workflows. Quote, what is new is the way we're trying to use these tools. The way these works of art have been dealt with before has been mainly purely analogue and they have been somewhat taken for granted. Nobody has really been looking at them from the point of view of the artists. We want to understand how these paintings were made. Chemical imaging involves you, no, involves X-ray fluorescence. X-ray, which we know are more commonly used in checking for fractures, create a map of the surface of the painting down to the molecular level, including its chemical properties. Another process, hyperspectral imaging, words are hard, analyzes the painting on multiple wavelengths, such as ultraviolet or infrared, revealing more than is visible to the human eye. This all sounds fascinating. I'm going to be very clear. I don't know. Once I got past x-ray, I don't really know what those words mean. When I think of ultraviolet light, I think of my misspent youth in the nightclubs wearing body paint. <laughs> the digital technology that was used in these tombs uh, that date from the Ramesside period in ancient Egypt. So the this technology it's going to be it's going to it seems what's incredible is look how portable it is so what's great is you haven't got to take stuff up to learn more about it a 2000 year old roman pewter hoard has been found in suffolk this is they've got pewter plates platters bowls and a cup these vessels were carefully Fully stacked in a pit, suggesting they were buried as a single group, possibly for safekeeping or as an offering. Or, my suggestion, somebody's kids <laughs> knew that mum and dad were coming home after being away for a week and they'd not done no washing up. <laughs> so they just buried it <laughs> and went, Good know where it went, mum, dad, sauce. I'm being silly, but funny. Um, that would be funny if that was the case. This was found in 2022 by a local mesh detectorist. Get yourselves a mesh detector, but remember, there are laws in some places. We are told, quote, this is a significant discovery. The larger plates and platters were used to allow food to be served communally, and the octagonal bowls may have a Christian reference. Similar hordes are found across southern Britain, including from nearby large Roman settlements at Icklingham and Hockwood. Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service facilitated the excavation of the whole hoard, which was carried out by Wardell Armstrong and Norfolk um, Museum Surface cons uh, Conservators. We are told that there's uh, evidence of heavy plough damage to the vessels. There's corrosion that's fused some together and the as pewter is not a precious precious metal, the treasure is of inestimable archaeological value. And so, but because the metal isn't precious, it does not qualify as official treasure and therefore belongs to the property owner. This hoard was discovered on the Euston estate, making the Duke of Grafton the owner. He, however, donated it to the West Stowe Anglo-Saxon Village and Museum, which is located near Burris St Edmunds. The Duke of Grafton, 
from the youth in the state said, quote, we were happy to donate this hoard and make it available for the public to see. Everyone can then share in the joy of this historic Suffolk find. There's been an archaeological dig in Galilee and it has uncovered mosaics of Samson and commemorative inscriptions. This, this spectacular mosaic panel dates to around 400 CE. It's in the late Roman synagogue at Hukok, an ancient Jewish village in Israel's Lower Galilee. This newly discovered mosaic contains uh, consists of a large panel, in the centre of which an enigmatic Hebrew inscription is framed in a wreath. To the two sides of the wreath, an Aramaic inscription lists the names of either the donors who provided funding for the synagogue's mosaic or the artists who made them. The wreath is flanked on either side by lions uh, resting their forepaws on bulls' heads. The entire panel is surrounded by a decorated border showing animals of prey pursuing other animals. So, the the in this archaeological project at Hukok has left an extraordinary legacy of significant finds, including, we've got this list here, a Hebrew inscription surrounded by human figures, animals, and mythological creatures, including Puti, or Cupid's little angels, the first non-biblical story ever found decorating an ancient synagogue, perhaps the legendary meeting between Alexander the Great and the Jewish high priest. A parody depiction of two of the spies sent to Moses, sent by Moses to explore Canaan, carrying a pole with a cluster of grapes, lead labelled a pole between two from Numbers 13:23. There's a another panel showing a man leading an animal on a rope accompanied by the inscription, a small child shall lead them, from Isaiah 11.6. Uh, figures of animals identified by an Aramaic inscription as the four beasts representing the four kingdoms in the book of Daniel. There's a large panel in the northwest aisle depicting Elim, the spot where the Israelites camped by the 12 springs and 70 date palms after departing uh, Egypt in Exodus. There's a Noah's Ark, the parting of the Red Sea, a Helios Zodiac cycle, Jonah being swallowed by three successive fish, and the building of the Tower of Babel. Archaeologists have discovered that in the early 14th century CE, this synagogue was rebuilt and expanded in size. This development apparently occurred in the wake of the establishment of a new international highway connecting Cairo and Damascus. The 2022 and 2023 excavations brought to light an enormous stone paved courtyard surrounded by a row of columns known as a colonnade to the east of the synagogue. In the late medieval period, the courtyard was reused and a massive vaulted structure of known function was built on top of it. With the conclusion of this final season of excavations, the excavated area is going to be turned over to the IAA, the Israel Antiquities Authority, and also to the Jewish National Fund, which are planning to develop the site as a tourist attraction. So when that opens, trust and believe, I will be updating you. Let's go medieval. Um, or rather Viking. We've got an ornate Viking era relic that was unearthed by a metal detectorist in the UK. And this one's going up for auction. It's a thousand year old and it was found in Norfolk. And this, they, they, so they took out a, a hobbyist's bit, bit, <laughs> metal detector, <laughs> beep, beep, one of those, you know what I mean? Um, and they got a loud signal. They, found this and they weren't quite sure what it was so they put it on facebook and and they were told that it went back to the viking era people from scandinavia suggested that it was a viking piece of the Ernest style it's about five and a half inches in length and it's a press blech die an object used for making foil mounts 
that had been cast in bronze with a high relief design on its face, linking it to the 11th century and the later phase of Viking art. The ornamentation depicts what is likely to be the Idrisil, the sacred tree of North Mytho North Myth Norse mythology, that was chewy, that connects the nine worlds. So they think that, so they often notify the local archaeologist of the discovery and registering it with the portable antiquity scheme. Apparently not antiquities, but it's now going to hit the auction house. It's going up for auction tomorrow. July the 18th, the estimate being it's going to fetch between 16,000 to 24,000 pounds. The plan being that when this is sold, it the person who found it is going to split the proceeds with the landowner upon whose land this piece was found. It's thought that this die would have been used to make a stamped foil of thin metal, which would then display the pressed out image. From its fine spot, the date and design, it's possible that the die was used on a Viking iron helmet to make ornamentation for the cheek guards um, so this militaristic purpose lines up with an era in England marked by Norman invasions led by William the Conqueror he was only the Conqueror after he won before then he was just William Duke of Normandy or William the Bastard uh, so this what we have is something for somebody is making the cheek bits for um helmets so what else they're going to find i hope they're going to be digging a lot more stuff no you don't want to see me going viking i'm a biter <laughs> sometimes Uh, um, sticking with the Vikings, the, a, a little sword has been found. This A Norwegian couple has found a Viking age grave and sword in their garden. We got ducks in our garden the other day. That was pretty cool. Mummy duck laid its eggies in our communal garden and we had baby ducklings. The children were very excited. It's not always necessary to travel far to make a remarkable archaeological find, we're told. But this this Norwegian couple are expanding their home. It's always when somebody is putting down a road or building something new, we find cool stuff. They found this, removed the grass and topsoil, found an oblong stone, didn't think much of it, kept digging. Uh, digging the bucket into the next layer, this iron thing popped up. Quote, I looked at it and thought, that looks a lot like a sword blade. And that's when I released the contents of the digging bucket, the hilt of the sword fell out. Oh, God. Incredibly fragile. <laughs> Very old. In the ground, metal sword. Oh, that doesn't, don't want that falling down. Look at it as well. It looks fragile. Oh, wow. Um, so, archaeologist came. Had a look at it and could and confirmed that a Viking was once laid to rest. The sword itself lets them date the find. The two pieces of that were found make out a 70 centimeter long sword with a blade that's five centimeters at its broadest. The hilt tells us that it's a sword from the Viking Age. So it's a hilt that is an object of fashion. The style of the hilt is found places it at the end of the 800 the beginning of, the, of 900 quote we have datings for different stars of hilt from year zero we have a pretty good overview of how these hilts have changed from the early iron age into the middle ages so there we go we've now got the hilt on display there and the sword I mean, it's, I don't think it's actually a little sword. I refer to it as little sword dismissively. This is a big, this is 70 centimetres long. It, so it just, it's not actually a little sword. The photographs are not doing it justice. So you can actually see um, that that's a, that's, that would have been heavy. Um, little was the wrong word to use.
a gold ring found in Fish Lake by a detectorist has been bought by Doncaster Council. This is a medieval gold ring found in a field once again by an amateur detectorist. Oh, two Americans know how big 70 centimetres is. Big. <laughs> so hang on. Um, Jamie, if you're listening, um, text me. What is 70 centimetres in inches, please? Thank you. Tell me what it is. Do the maths. <laughs> Help. <laughs> Help. Um, so, this is a beautiful piece. Uh, in accordance with the rules, he reported his find to... It's 27.5 inches. Thank you, Jamie. Hero. Um, 27.5 inches. I mean... It's 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 a it's a it's a stand. It's, to me, it sounds like the size of a fairly standard side side sword, and uh, uh, having it being f like five centimeters at its widest, that would um that would do you some some damage. So yeah, twenty seven. So it's a little over two foot, which for a blade, I wouldn't give that to a child, especially not my child. He's currently going through a phase where um he's using wands a lot and they are he's, he's very aggressive with his use of wands he seems to be very upset that i i won't turn into a coach and that my clothes will not magically become a ball dress so um i i get a, the wand pokes me while he tries to <laughs> make stuff happen so rightly so the person who found it uh, reported it as treasure under the british museum's portable antiquity scheme this has now been bought for £12,500 by Heritage Doncaster, which runs the, the city's uh, sites and museums. Around the bezel of this ring is a medieval French inscription that translates to, think of me, P. They don't know if P is the recipient or the giver of the ring. It's thought that because of the lettering and style, this is a 13th to 14th century ring. And... Councillor Councillor Nigel Bell said, quote, we are so pleased that we've now been able to acquire this piece of treasure, which will be on show for future generations here in Doncaster. It's going to be displayed at the Danham Gallery Library and Museum in Doncaster later this summer. The other morning, my son... <laughs> was not awake he's not three yet in fact i got up and went to you know brush my teeth and he obviously heard this and then opened his bedroom door and he looked at me in my face now if this kid's awake he opens the door he looked me in my face and he went mummy i've been awake for hours and i was all alone you and daddy were asleep just bold-faced <laughs> deception and then he goes Elsa you broke my heart because we're going through a frozen phase and you only find out um, which character you are because he names you and that you then know who he is so I'm either Anna or Elsa <laughs> daddy's Olaf <laughs> I don't know why daddy's the snowman I'm like isn't daddy Kristoff no Dad daddy's Olaf <laughs> Okay, we're having a fun time. We're having a very fun time. Daycare are, are dealing with the fact that he wants everybody to play Frozen and he gets very upset if people don't want to play Frozen with him. Um, He's very dramatic. He's And he also, he gives me the side eye. Um, well, what I call spicy eye. He does this, he gives me spicy eyes. It's good times. Good times. So I've not got pictures of this one because it does show human remains and we know I don't show those. But a Dublin, if you want to see it, there are many photographs uh, in this linked web, um, article, but I'm not going to show it. So this is a 1000 year old burial site that has been found as they are try as they are setting out to build a new hotel in Dublin, building work once again. This was found at Capel Street, where an abbey called St Mary's once stood. 
At least two of the remains, it's thought, date back to the 11th, the early 11th century. Carbon dating of one of the graves discovered that it predates that the, the 12th century by about 100 years, indicating the presence of a Christian settlement on the site prior to St. Mary's being built. Uh, these finds are discovered close to a former Presbyterian meeting house that itself dates from 1667. It this is part, and there's also parts of a domestic house known as Dutch Billies have also been found. They were constructed in about 1700 by settlers who came to Dublin after William of Orange ascended to the thrones of England and Scotland and Ireland in 1689. So these remains are being excavated, cleaned, and set for further analysis before being given to the National Monument Services. Other structures found during the examination of the site are going to be incorporated in the design for the new hotel. We are told this Dublin project is by far the biggest and most complex project to date that's being worked on. And the 17th century Presbyterian Meeting House is going to be a central part of the development of a new bar and restaurant complex. OK, see how that works out. I'm, I'm, pa I'm pausing there. OK. Um, the Dutch Billy's house will also be preserved while a building with surviving ovens from the Boland's Bakery, dated from 1890, will be renovated and repurposed. Talking about St Mary's Abbey, it was, we are told, Ireland's largest and most wealthy medieval abbey in its day, but it was demolished in 1540 when the monastery was disbanded by Henry VIII. And the it was later then the site of that 17th century Presbyterian meeting house. There we go. This this one, this one. I'm as as more information comes out, I'm really keen to make a video on on this. So yeah, this I am still live because there's so much history news. We're gonna we I've I've still got like about 10 more pages to get through. <laughs> I've just got a I talk too much. I apologise. <laughs> Hope you had a good grocery shop, though. This is incredible. Bridge Library has used new techniques to uncover passages from Camden's annals. This is the first official account of Elizabeth's reign. It was commissioned by her successor, King James the First, but there are passages that have been heavily revised and censored by their author. There's a state of the archaeology that's been used that has found finding in the record. This is yeah, this is fabulous. So what they found. They have it it casts new light on really significant historical episodes, such as things I've made videos on, on this channel, such as Elizabeth's explanation by Pope Pius the the Fifth, and also her nomination as James as her successor. So Julian Harrison, who is the British Library's lead curator of medieval historical and literary manuscripts, told The Guardian, where this article is, is published, that seeing it was heart-stopping. I can only imagine. He said, quote, it's really one of those moments where now you can't see anything, now you can. The absolute reversal of now you see it, now you don't. This imaging is revolutionary. We've never done anything quite like this before. The annals are written in Latin and they are based on first-hand evidence uh, reports and records these are we, there are 10 volumes of handwritten manuscripts modern historians have used camden's annals as a, a resource as a source to use as potentially something that is impartial because it's it's a, a jacobean but clearly we are seeing that large sections are that the key sections have been revised they were therefore deliberately rewritten to present a version of Elizabeth's reign that is more um, pleasant to her successor. For example, the claim that Elizabeth I named James VI as her successor on her deathbed. This is a well-worn claim that she either verbally said it, that she signalled something, some she had some finger motion that said, no, he is the one with the crown. I have never believed that. Never, ever believed it. I... 
I don't believe that Elizabeth ever named anybody as her successor. I believe Robert Cecil fabricated that at, with the collusion of people who were also in the room because they wanted to do as much as they possibly could to have a smooth succession. I don't blame them, but I don't believe she ever named anyone. And I think, is she honestly, I wonder if she had named anybody, I wonder if she would have named Arbella. I don't know. I don't know. So there is, there, there is, um, in terms of the excommun excommunication by Pope Pius, Camden apparently said the Pope was motivated to do so by, quote, spiritual warfare. And the only to replace it in the published version with the statements that Pius was creating secret plots against Elizabeth. By removing the inflammatory wording, Camden made the official record more neutral in tone. There is, we're told, still more to be discovered. It's going to be interesting how modern interpretations of Elizabeth might be changed by it. <sighs> so exciting. This is so exciting. Uh, this it's it's incredible. This is this is. In what people leave out and edit, we can really learn a lot. I cannot wait. Trust and believe there's gonna be there's gonna be some some stuff going on there. Sorry if I'm cutting it out. I wonder whether she might have pointed towards Arbella or Arabella Stewart as her as her heir. And I say that because it's it's worth pointing out that the line of Margaret Tudor from which Mary Queen of Scots and James descend appears to have been deliberately left out by Elizabeth's father Henry VIII. I am inclined to think that it's possible that Elizabeth thought they should be excluded because they had been born outside of England, that they were born on Scottish soil. The same is not true. Although she is James's cousin, Arbella is born on English soil. She was also welcomed at Elizabeth's court. James wasn't. The other two people that Elizabeth welcomed at her court until they made marriages that she didn't approve of or know about were the two remaining Grey sisters, Catherine and Mary, who were also named as heirs. Elizabeth never named an heir. I don't think she did on the deathbed, but if she did, I wonder if it would have been someone that she met. The Grey girls are ruled out because they're both dead, but are Bella not ruled out? So are Bella's, the, the question about are Bella's mental state this, I being raised by Bess of Hardwick can't have been easy. <laughs> I don't think she was mentally unstable. I think she was a woman who was being infantilized and was frustrated. She wanted to make a marriage that was being prevented. And then when she did so, a drastically unsuitable cad that she married, who blimmin' well left her, and, you know, had a, had a happy life. Um, she was bereft and imprisoned in the tower and ultimately, we think, may have starved herself to death because I just fe feel like she felt like she was out of options. I don't know if that's a sign of mental instability or actually if that is a situation would, that would make anybody utterly fucking sorry, utterly desperate to the point where they might behave in ways that seems inappropriate. I do apologise for nearly dropping the F-bomb there. Um, <laughs> I forgot where I was for a second. But yeah, so I think I... I don't think Elizabeth named anybody as her, her successor. I think she was... By the time it got to the finger-waving that Cecil claims happened or the verbalisation, I think she's non-verbal, possibly unconscious. So I don't think she's naming or signalling anybody. But if she did, I wonder if it would have been Arbella. But I cannot prove it. I mean, I've been live for two hours. Frankly, it's a miracle we've got this far without me. 
dropping the f bomb because I usually use it like it's a comma. <laughs> right, let's. We have got a German shipwreck, four hundred year old treasures. Look at this lovely bottle top neck thing. This was found eighty around eighteen months ago. It's the wreck of a 17th century Hanseatic trading ship and this marks the first successful salvage of a trading ship from that time period in this region. This find we're told is, is especially important because it gives an indication of what daily life is like on the ship. Several warships have been found in the Baltic Sea. This trading ship is uh, gives an offer and offers an insight into civilian life. This includes a liquor bottle with the word London or L-O-N-D-N written on it. There are animal bones and residue found on pieces of porcelain that also offer an insight into what is eaten on board. These finds are now going to be subjected to 3D scans in a storage hall in Lübeck, which they will be stored in water tanks and they will quickly dry out and decay. That It's also thought that once investigations are complete, the found item will be sunk again to preserve them for future generations and that might sound bizarre but I think that the experience of working on and what people learned from working on the Mary Rose and the technology and the expense that was needed to get that to a point where it was stable it has taken decades 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 to do so Resinking it into mud or water that will <laughs> that will protect and preserve it is perhaps oddly the safest thing to do once it's been documented. I, I and I know it's a shame that we're we'll able to see it, but it, it, it's the expense of drying that out and preserving it in a way is it, it's something that very few institutions can manage. And Jesse. <laughs> Thank you very much for the for the super chat, but let's not encourage my worst my worst attributes, which is the fact that I I swear like a sailor. <laughs> You're naughty. Thank you. Um, it it you know it does look like a little bit like an like an inkwell. Um, I'm not sure how much of the the uh bit is broken so i think it, it reminds me of like an old sort of gin bottle i wish i was a cockney i'm a north londoner so i do i'm i do, i sound i don't sound like a cockney i just sound like i come from london i live in i live in east london but even then there are very few proper cockney because to be a Cockney, you have to be born in the sound of Bow Bells. And to my knowledge, there is now no extant maternity unit that would allow somebody to be born within the sound of Bow Bells. So unless there's a home birth, there is not there. We're, the Cockneys are going to be a dying breed. No, you can't. You can't. Don't encourage the F word. Don't encourage the F word. Don't do it to me because it's, you know, it's my natural state. <laughs> um, oh, really? I thought they were done. Oh, boy. That's going to, that's, yeah. Fortunately, it does, it does uh, draw. Uh, quite a lot of cash to it, fortunately. In front of you. <laughs> In front of you. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Staying with um, maritime stuff. I am a cockney at heart. I am. I want to be a pearly queen. I'd love it. A portrait of a naval officer languishing in storage has been determined to actually have been by Gainsborough. 
fabulous. This has been cast away in storage for decades. And it's uh, Thomas Gainsborough, the famed 18th century portraitist. This is the Royal Museum's Greenwich, who said originally that it uh, the painting had an affinity with Gainsborough, but was too coarse to be his work. Turns out, <laughs> not so much. It's an unsigned portrait of Captain Frederick Cornwall, given to the Royal Museum's Greenwich in 1960. It was attributed to, by, to Gainsborough at the time, but then the curator was like, nah, it's just, it's Gainsborough-like, it ain't, it ain't the one. But then a Gainsborough expert last year found an early 20th century image of the portrait and then traced the provenance to Jones and then lost the thread. Eventually, it was spotted in an, the, it was spotted in an illustrated catalogue of the holdings. Then the Hugh Besley, uh, Belsey asked for it to be rescued from storage looked at it and was like, oh, that is a Gainsborough. Um, the curator who, uh, the current curator of the Royal Museum's Greenwich agreed. So the current curator, Catherine Gazard, called this misattribution a cautionary tale and said that they were excited rather than embarrassed. As to why the 1960s curator didn't believe the portrait to be an authentic Gainsborough, Bell's Belsey told the Guardian that the painter was, quote, developing at a very fast pace. And he attract, as he attracted more commissions, his style became more assured and his brushstroke freer. The Royal Museum's Greenwich have started fundraising to have both the painting and its frame restored, which is expected to cost around £60,000. And next year, it's going to be hung in the Queen's House, which is, which is looked after by the Royal Museum's Greenwich. The portrait of the naval officer was languishing in storage. The naval officer himself, I'm assume, is I assume has been safely buried in consecrated ground because he was a naval officer and thus rich. So <laughs> he's fine. Um, but it was the portrait that was languishing in the storage. Mm, it's a good. This is a good question. What's up with the guy's sleeve? Is he an amputee? Could be. Could be. Or could be doing something fashionable. I need to investigate whether this, I don't know who this this naval officer is, so I don't know if he lost his hand in a cannon accident or some such. Was the last battle of the American Revolution fought in India? Well, apparently, as we can see here, a number of historians, a growing number of historians, think that it was. Uh, this is very, I'll, I'll be completely honest, my knowledge of the American Revolution is poor. Um, and my study, oh, that was a whistle, sorry. My study of American history, we did the sort of wounded knee. We did manifest destiny. We didn't quite, we didn't quite get to this. So um, this is out of my wheelhouse. However, the Yorktown defeat is the place where people say that Britain looks to cut its losses. Peace negotiations start in Paris, uh, the signing of a preliminary peace deal between the colonies and Britain in November of 1782. However, news travelled at the speed of, sh of sailing ships to the far reaches of the empire. So after Yorktown, fighting between Britain, France and Spain continued elsewhere in places like Jamaica, Gibraltar and India. So continuing on, speaking to CNN from his, from his home in Seattle, Glickstein argues that controlling Ingl India was a much bigger price for Britain than controlling portions of North America. British colonisers coveted its resources like silk, cotton, textiles, spices, tea, opium and precious stones. Historians point out that the British plundering of Indian wealth during the colonial years turned India's, India's economy, economy from a near peer of Europe to something exponentially smaller. When France entered the war in 1778 as an American ally, the British East India Company immediately moved to attack France's Indian colonies, drawing both countries' Indian allies into the fight. Well, wouldn't you know, a proxy war fought on somebody else's soil. We don't do that anymore at all. 
So um, the fighting takes place land and sea. There's the naval battle of Coudelor on June 20th was considered a French victories. Um, but the besieged French forces tried to attack British troops and they were pushed back. So back at sea, the French admiral orders his ships to prepare a bombardment of British land forces in support of the French ground operation. Before it could commence, a British ship appeared in the distance flying a white flag. They brought news that six months before in Paris, the British, French and Americans, and the Dutch were a little later, signed the Treaty of Paris that ended the American Revolution. So Coudelor, India, was indeed the last battle of the American Revolution. How fascinating is that? Thank you, Aurora. I'm very pleased to be of service. <laughs> Thank you. There are also more than a few battles fought after Yorktown. I'm, I have no doubt, as I say, a, 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 I'm embarrassed to say that my knowledge of this is abysmal. But I, it's it's not something I'm in any way. I'm not proud of that fact. It, I do need to, I do need to look into it more. Uh, but I will be, be honest. The battley bits of stuff is my least favourite. It's my least. I, it's my least favourite bit of history. The troop movements and the sneaky, sneaky, and who's in the mud and who's on a bridge and blah, 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 who's got cavalry and, blah, 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 and archers. Like I, I mean, I think Welsh Welsh archers are cool. I want to learn about the bow and the archery. I don't want to learn about formation. So I don't find battles a bit dull, I'll be honest. Um, but there's plenty of historians who 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 don't. And, and that can be for them. Not for me. <laughs> Did we see this? An unpublished letter by Abraham Lincoln has been discovered in Pennsylvania. It offers a rare insight into this president's strategic thinking in the first year of the conflict, the Civil War conflict. The recipient of the letter is Charles Ellett Jr., who's later a colonel in the Union Army. He wrote to Lincoln seeking the formation of a well-funded civil engineer corps to help to fortify Washington against the Confederate threat. We are being told this letter, quote, fills in a part of the historical record that had been missing. It's namely a position in a chain of communication detailing Ellett's efforts to seek the foundation and funding for a civil engineering corps uh, to, quote, survey terrain, disrupt Confederate supply chains and defend the city of Washington. Lincoln wrote, quote, you propose raising for the service of a U.S. a civil engineer corps. I'm not capable to judge the value of such a corps but I'd be glad to accept one if approved by General Scott, General McClellan and General Toton. Totten, please see them and get their views upon it. Is that... That feels very humble to me. That I read that and I thought, that is somebody who goes, I'm not an expert in this. Um, I need advice. Can you seek it out for me? I... I feel like that's really impressive, actually. So McClellan re apparently refused to meet Ellett, and so the project was shelved until 1862, when a Union fleet was destroyed by the Confederate ironclad ramming ship Merrimack at the Battle of Hampton Roads. Lincoln's humiliated, and so he appoints Ellett, then 52, as army colonel to lead a hasty construction prog programme. Poor old Ellet is shot aboard one of the Union's own ironclad vessels. Is this like an armoured ship? Ironclad, armoured, right? On the Mississippi River later that year in the Battle of Memphis and died two weeks later. Blimey. Nothing like a promotion to ruin your life, eh? Um, it's There was no record of Lincoln's letter ever having reached the market publicly or appearing in any published works. Quote, its existence is referenced in a privately printed work by a descendant of Ellet. So even he, even here, its content is not noted. So there is a, we're told, a thriving market for Civil War memorabilia with autograph Lincoln artefacts in particular demand. This, 
the most expensive check to change hands was a copy of his 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, which was owned by the family of John F. Kennedy that sold at Sotheby's in New York in 2010 for $3.8 million. Uh, a signed copy of Lincoln's 1864 election victory speech sold for $3.4 million a year earlier. So I'm wondering if that means that this is also going up for auction. If it does, I will update. Staying with the Civil War. Look at, that is a bucket load of coins. <laughs> Huge Civil War era gold and silver coin hoard found on a Kentucky farm. My goodness, this is being referred to as the Great Kentucky Hoard. It's got hundreds of US gold pieces dating from 1840 to 1863, including also a handful of silver coins. Now, according to the new Mismatic Guarantee Company, they were who certified the coins' authenticity, and to the government mint where the coins were sold, 95% of this hoard is comprised of gold dollars, along with 20 $10 Liberty coins and eight $20 Liberty coins. Somebody who knows about an American, high Americans, the, those, those coins aren't normally that, those are notes, right? Obviously, I haven't got notes at this period. Are these coins rare at the time of them being minted? Like, were they special coins then? Or were there loads of these coins going around? Does anybody know? Because that feels like a $10 Liberty coin, $20 Liberty coin, feels like at the time they would have been very special when first minted. Let me know. Um, the $20 Liberty coins are in the hoard are even rarer because they don't include In God We Trust, which is added in 1866 after the end of the Civil War. Hoard coins, we're told, are federal currency and it may be a result of a Kentuckian's dealings with the federal government, dealings that would be wise to conceal from a Confederate raiding party. So perhaps somebody was dealing with the Union and had to bury the evidence. Most concentrations of historical artefacts found on private land end up going to market or being collected without archaeological consultation according to McNutt, quote, as a conflict archaeologist, I find this loss of information particularly frustrating. He said, hordes have an incredible amount of information about the person who collected objects, offering archaeologists a insight into a brief window of time. This is interesting. I, I didn't know this. Historical finds like these on private land in the US do not need to be reported to an archaeologist. But McNutt, who has developed close relationships with land donors believes that education and outreach are key to learning more about these rare coins. We are told by McNutt, quote, it's entirely up to the landowner, which if they don't engage with an archaeologist, though, it does mean that a snapshot of the past is lost forever. They, they, should, they should fix that. They should fix that. So these coins minted 1840 and 1863, we are told. 1840 to 1863. The Liberty coin um, is itself was in circulation from 1850 to 1907. But the later coins, the later of that span are not in this hoard, although the coin was around for longer. So the, you believe the Confederacy were printing paper bills, so maybe gold and silver coinage would have been more impressive, something the Union would have been more likely to produce. That's interesting. Oh, that's an interesting. Well, okay, good to know. Yes, I know, I know about um, the laws there, which seemingly from the stuff we've covered on all obeyed but yeah this is this is treasure in to anybody's to anybody's mind this is treasure it's gold it's old that rhymed um this this is treasure and it and it 
should be studied uh, and explored for for the benefit of the nation. Oh, so these coins, they are they were common enough. Oh, thank you. Okay. They just, the amounts just felt like they were really special. And I suppose also in gold, like in the medieval period, gold coins like angels are really special. But um okay, there these are by this point, these are it's a different situation. Thank you for that. This one is something else I don't know anything about. Never heard of this at all. Archaeologists are searching for the legendary Kingswood elephant. From Bostock and Wombwell's Wombwell's Menagerie. This is apparently from a travelling show. Uh, menageries featuring wild and exotic animals were a fashionable form of entertainment in the Victorian into the early 20th century. Animals were imported to the UK to join animal exhibitions, performing circus acts and travelling shows. Dr. Steve Ward, a circus historian, what is a what a cool job, said, quote, during the 19th century, the fascination with the natural world allowed both travelling and static menageries to flourish. People wanted to experience exotic and strange animals. Seeing these creatures was seen as educational. Indeed, the government actively encouraged families to take their children. But merely viewing them was not enough. The public also wanted to be entertained. So in some menageries, animal keepers began to perform tricks with the beasts. Yay! Especially with the large carnivores and elephants. Good choice. So as part of South Gloucestershire Council's Kingswood Regeneration Project, archaeologists from Wessex Archaeology have been conduct have been commissioned to conduct a geophys survey to see if they can find the fabled burial site of the elephant that died in 1891. I had no idea about this. So they are going to be looking for the burial and if they do, perhaps we'll find other stuff, other information about how this operated. A zoo archaeologist at Wessex Archaeology said, quote, this initial archaeological investigation aims to locate the elephant burial, but should we do so, you may be surprised at what we could look learn about the life of this animal from studying its skeletal remains now that's the, we know that the elephant that was housed at the tower of london many centuries before this because they knew it came from a hot place and they were still working on the premise of the four humors they were like well we can keep it warm so wine <laughs> so it had a very short i hope happy drunk life In the case of a menagerie elephant, as well as understanding where the animal came from and its age, we may be able to see the impact of its life as an entertainer. Um, so evidence of confinement, including trauma from shackling the animal or from arthritis, may be, we'll they will find injuries and strains from performance duties like repetitive move movements. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think this animal had a happy life either. Uh, I hope the medieval, the the tower elephant had a happier life because it was inebriated, I hope. John Harvey, we are told, used to be synonymous with the city of Salisbury. He was, after all, the founder. But there was, this is Salisbury, not English Salisbury. This is Salisbury, north of Adelaide in Australia. But we are told there's one fact about Mr. Harvey that almost nobody knew, um, that he was a man of African descent. History, we are told, leaves out that detail. The pictures don't, though, do they? Um, he was only 18 when he arrived on Australian so soil, and nine years later he was constructing the city we know as Salisbury. Excellent. He was a, la a landowner, built a number of prominent buildings, including the Salisbury Hotel and St. John's Church. Apparently his African heritage came as a, as a surprise to his great-great-grandson, Paul Harvey. In the early years, I found out that John Harvey was interviewed not long before he died in 1899, and he mentioned about his parents being of St. Saint Helena origin, which is an island off of South Africa, and that was a bit of a surprise to us. As time went on, knowledge of the Harvey family and John's heritage seemed to have gotten lost in the growth and development of the city he founded. I think nowadays, because Salisbury has 
and then so much is probably not common knowledge. But back in my days, everyone knew about John Harvey. Mr. Harvey recalled growing up and going into shops and owners asking if he was related to John Harvey, often getting great service as a result. But he said it was a small community back then and times have changed. And this is really interesting. And what it, the thing it's it conjured in my mind, it it conjured in my mind the the thing that we have to remember consistently that we are always viewing the past through our own view our own gaze the things that matter to us the things that are notable to us are potentially not worthy of note all of the time depending on context in the past for some reason this individual's racial origins ethnic origins were viewed as being not worthy of note. I don't believe it was some secret. I, I, the, he, they are viewed as being not worthy of note. And I think that's quite interesting to remember. Similarly, when we talk about people's like emotional interior and their thought process and what they're going through, we have to remember that the language we are using, the language we are capable of using, is because we live in a post-psychoanalysis world. It has altered. It has completely altered the way in which we we talk about things. It, it's added words to the general lexicon that weren't there before. But and it, the, well, the other thing this reminded me of is I was doing some interpretation work at the transport museum, having a great time. I was playing a suffragette, and I was talking about um, votes and getting votes and equal franchise, and you know, men who couldn't vote, et cetera, et cetera, and. I was talking to this incredible family and they'd just been to speak to my friend who was portraying somebody who'd come over on the Windrush. And the father of the family asked me, well, when were, when were black men allowed to vote? And the question hadn't even crossed my mind. And I was thinking back to what I'd looked at on the statutes and, and the laws. And I went, well, when they own property, if they if they own if they fulfilled the requirements of owning property being over the age of 21 and having been resident in the country for a year then then that was when and so i did go and look it up and um find the first recorded black british voter and that individual does date to the 1700s uh, and there's a portrait of him he looks like a very fine chap and i was thinking maybe i could do a, a video i have to do some more investigation of his life uh, and sort of see his story a bit more but I, I thought it was quite a cool thing that I only found out because somebody asked me a question that I wasn't 100% sure of the answer to and I, I do love it when I get questions like that a little vase bought at a thrift shop it's set to potentially sell for $11,800 this look at it little baby now this is actually a little one you can see it in somebody's hands it was bought at a uk thrift store we call them charity shops here um for just two pound fifty or three thirty three dollars and thirty cents that's how your money works isn't it um and yes we this was i don't know what charity shop it was in so i don't know how thrift shop work in the state but in the uk it will be like cancer research charity age concern charity bernardo's and they'll have a shop and you go in and buy stuff like this so it's a 10 centimeter or four inch little thing that was spotted by a couple in surrey and the karen who is the seller said my partner Ahmet and i walked into a charity shop to have a look around i always have the books he looks at the vintage stuff he's no expert but he has got great taste he came over and showed me the vase and I was a bit dismissive, saying very pretty. He went, no, look at the base and show me the etch marks. They suspected the etchings could be significant, but had no idea what it could be worth. So they bought it. Specialists identified the vase as being a work of a late Japanese ceramist. Is that how you pronounce that? Ceramics artist and cloisine artist. Uh, cloison? I think that's the art style. Um, Namikawa. Yes, uh, Yasuyuki, Na Naki Namikawa Yasuyuki, who, who was who was alive between 1845 and 1927, apparently one of um, Japan's most famous artists from the Meiji period. And 
I'm assuming that croissant is the artistic style on the vase. Yes, an intricate enameling technique which involves soldering delicate metal strips of wire bent to an outline of design to a metal surface. The small spaces created in the enclosed outline are then filled with coloured enamel paste before the entire thing is fired, smoothed off and polished. This vase is going to be available to bid on in a two-day auction that's going to begin on July 29th and go to July 30th. The couple selling it is going to give a generous donation to the charity shop where they found the item. A larger vase by the same artist sold for £29,000 or $38,000 in April 2019. Cloisonne. 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 Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Cloisonne. Right. Construction workers have uncovered the remains of Munich's main synagogue, which was destroyed by the Nazis in 1938. So they have found a stone tablet with the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. It was found by construction workers in the southern German city who were working on renovation of a weir on the Isa River. They were working on a small scale dam and they came across the columns of the former synagogue together with the stone tablet inscribed with the Ten Commandments. Bernard Purin, who is the head of Munich's Jewish Museum, said, I never thought we'd find anything from the old synagogue. I felt happy and sad at the same time about this extraordinary find. What happens next, we're told, is unclear. They've only found a part of the synagogue. It's just it's just a fragment. There's going to be a long project to figure out which parts belong to which parts belong to which part of the former synagogue. In an email to CNN, Charlotte Knobloch, who is the president of the Jewish community of Munich and Upper Bavaria, described the synagogue as a majestic building. She added, quote, I was lucky to see a young girl before Hitler ordered it torn down in June of 1938. Given how ruthless and quick the demolition took place, I could not imagine any piece of it would ever be seen again until last week. Seeing parts of a synagogue that was thought lost for generations reappear like this is hard to comprehend. At the same time, I would be devastated to learn that the building's remains were apparently used as a filler material at the building site long after the Nazi era ended, and by the same company hired to tear down the synagogue in the first place. Today, we're working in close cooperation with the city of Munich and hoping to have the pieces returned to our community sooner rather than later. Munich's deputy mayor said that it's the city's duty to return the artefacts to the Jewish community. Quote, the extermination of Jewish citizens during Nazi era began with the destruction of Jewish culture. The demolition of the main synagogue on Hitler's orders marked the beginning of exclusion, persecution and destruction. The fact that we can today we can find remains of the of the once cityscape defining magnificent building is a stroke of luck and touches me deeply. Jewish life was an integral part of our city's history, present and future. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So let's skip on. Okay. Um, do you have what it takes to be the Met Museum's uh, head of provenance? <laughs> there is not enough money on earth. <laughs> um, and the, the salary is uh, $140,000 to $160,000, which is a, a large amount. Not enough, babe, not enough. They're investigating the sometimes murky backstories of the museum's vast holdings. Oh, I, ho I'm I hope they'll find someone good. Godspeed to that person. So, um, the Met has not disclosed the intended start date, but once hired, the head of provenance research will coordinate all inquiries into objects that might have Nazi era provenance or constitute cultural property. They're going to start with the Ancient America's department um, <laughs> and move on from there, I'm guessing. They will report directly to the director of the Met, Max Holline. 
uh, and will also serve as somewhat of a figurehead, attending conferences and seminars, driving communication of provenance information on the museum's website. So if the museum turns down repatriation, they it's going to be their face that has to back it. Oh, OK. It's not a large salary. Right. It feels large, but then maybe that's because I'm thinking of it in pounds. Well, OK. So they've, they've cheaped out then. Background check done by the DA, check done by the DA's office. Yep. <laughs> Agreed. Oh, you could not you could not pay me quote the head of provenance research will lead efforts across the Mets collection areas building on decades of research and the ongoing work of the Mets curators scholars and provenance researchers and the criminal investigations <laughs> have also been focused on your fine institution let's let's all it's also the work of the DA's office though isn't it babe uh, wow um art museums such as the Met steward important resources of world heritage Steward is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. We are committed to undertaking this work so that the Met can continue to be a leader in the field for both our current generation and many more to come. Good luck to the ship that you will be upon and all who sail in you. They're doing some building at Oxford Station. Uh, this is there's a 160 million pound railway station upgrade upgrade that has been paused because they found this a brick arch under Botley Road. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what a uh, a brick arch dates to, and it wasn't clear in this article. So they think it was part of a water control system beneath the road they know it wasn't used as bridge support they are investigating it that we are told that while this makes the project more complex and challenging than first anticipated they are now looking to extend their working hours hours so they can remove the arch and also still make their completion date um the labor councillor spoke to network rail and to, uh, and they told her they'd lost time but they are confident they were able to make up for it she said that if necessary approaching the city council for longer working hours to meet the october deadline was a possibility as we are paying people overtime for that though correct i'll be investigating um network rail said they were consulting with an archaeologist before removing the art Yvonne, the salary offered by the Met would be large by most standards, but not for someone living in New York. Well, that's where they have to live, though, isn't it? So they've they've cheat they're cheaping out based upon or oh, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something that happens with a lot of museum jobs. The expectation is that you come from money, so the salary is you know pocket change, and if you come from money and perhaps already have a base in New York, you are moving in the circles with the people who did this stuff in the first place, who have these items or items like them in their own homes, in their dad or mum's home, in their nonna's home. I wonder if that's why the salary is low, because it means that somebody who comes from money has to do it. And somebody who comes from money couldn't help but understand what everyone's been going through with their suffering. Hey, oh, I hate being a cynic. I hate being a cynic. But now I know it's not a high fee. <sighs> Ding dong. Where's my bell? Here he is. Little, my little, there he is, the little weeing boy, ding dong. Right. And do you know what? It's similar to the last, last time's ding dong. Um,
course of action after a teen vandalizes a Japanese temple. A 17 year old Canadian. So, this one is not British. He's not one of ours for once. Um, a 17 year old Canadian was questioned by police after carving Julian into a pillar at a centuries old temple. This is the Golden Hall Temple. The word Julian was put in, in it was inscribed in, in small letters last Friday into a wooden structure that was built 1,250 years ago. A Japanese tourist spotted the 17 year old scratching his name into the wood with his fingernail, who alerted, the, he then alerted staff who called the police. The teenager, whose name has not been disclosed because he's a minor, I'm guessing it's Julian. was questioned but has not have been has not been charged with a crime um he has been indicted for damaging important cultural property he could have faced up to five years in prison and a fine of up to one million yen which is around seven thousand two hundred dollars such an act is certainly sacrilegious yes especially in japan where cultural norms repudiate such practices this is ken tadashi who is uh a Oshima, who is a professor of Japanese architecture at the University of Washington. Keep keep your hands inside the vehicle. Like, I was very small when I was taught to look with my eyes, not with my hands. Trust and believe I say the exact same thing to my son. We go to museums a lot. And granted, young v &A might have broken that because you can touch things there. But, wow. It's still exactly. It's still an active house of worship. It unacceptable. Um, you saw Amanda. You saw a news article today. A Swedish teen vandalized the Colosseum. And as this is one not being yours, we love the king on our money. Hang on a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. And we've got to take the whole comment. I mean, fair. Fair. Oh, nominally, then he is blinking well one of ours, isn't he? That's a much nicer way of saying, look with your eyes, not with your hands. <laughs> Take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footsteps. Lovely. Lovely. Um, we are going on to our events and exhibitions, friends. So... This one is coming up. We've got a while for this one. This is coming up um, later this year in the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace, Holbein at the Tudor Court. These are the sketches, the drawings, the paintings, miniatures and book illustrations. They are on display in Buckingham Palace. I will be going. I am very excited to go and see them. I think it's going to be very lovely. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, as I should, I should have pointed out as well, um, with both the opera pin board and also in the description box, the number of this slide will tell you uh, links to get tickets or find out information. But also, if I've been able to find it, the accessibility information will also be linked. So uh, if you need that, it, it will all be linked if I've been able to find it. I was finding trouble. I could not find uh, accessibility information on this, possibly because it's a walking tour. I, I and I would if you need assistance, I would reach out. This is you can walk the ancient neighborhood of the Acropolis. So you can you can register online for this through the Acropolis website. It's recommended that you so if you're traveling out there, if you're or if you're there already, um go online and pre-book. If you want the these are 45 minute tours. If you're on the English version, that is every Friday at 11 a.m. If you are can do the Greek version that is every Friday at 1 p.m. It looks very exciting. What's even better is this is free, but you yeah, this is a free walking tour, but you need to have paid the admission tickets for the Acropolis itself. So there you can find out more about ticket prices if you click the link.
This it relates to that sale. This is the exhibition of that sale that we talked at in the repatriation section. It's already open, 8th of July. It's going to be around to the 23rd of October at the Christchurch Art Gallery. This is the sale where you can go and see that. And there are lots and lots of weekend events also. Remembering that this will be transferring to Auckland, I'm assuming, after the 23rd of October. So all that's linked down below as well. This one I have, it looks beautiful, but I have some questions about it that I couldn't find answers to. This is the American Museum of Natural History. There is a Van Cleef and Arpels jewellery exhibition, various green stones that have been part of Van Cleef and Arpels jewellery. I don't know where Van Cleef and Arpel sits in terms of conflict minerals, conflict diamonds, conflict stones. So I don't know. All I'm saying is there's a potential that for some people, the ethics around this exhibition, uh, and I don't know where the money is going, whether it's just going to the museum or whether Van Cleef and Arpels is going to get some cut of it. Uh, I would say approach with caution if this may affect or be affected by your ethical standpoint is what I'm going to say there I would like to do if I was going to go to this exhibition if it's on offer for me I would like to do more research before I paid money to find out where those funds are going to go etc etc just just they are still an active jeweler but I'm not sure if they if they're going to get funds from this exhibition or not I don't know um so I just want to flag it up um, I don't know what their position is on conflict minerals. I haven't looked it up. Just wanted to flag it. And I don't exactly. I also don't know where some of this jewelry did look old, pre 1980s. So high percentage chance of conflict minerals. Their green stones, emerald mines, famously not great. Diamond mines, not great. Emeralds and diamonds together. Yikes! 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 But I can't speak to it. It just it raised some it raised some red flags for me. So I just wanted to flag that. But at the same time, it's very much an exhibition that's of interest. So I wanted to share it with caveats in place. This is being reported as a new museum, the International African American Museum. This is in Charleston, South Carolina. We are talking here about a $120 million project that opened its doors very recently. And we are told that it's no ordinary tourist attraction. The museum is built on scarred and sacred ground, Gadsden's Wolf, which we are told in this article it tells us is the arrival point for nearly half of all enslaved Africans who were shipped to the U.S., the quote, we were able to find this outline of what had been a building, and we believe it was one of the main storehouses. This is Malika Pryor, who is the museum's chief learning and engagement officer. She continues, uh, we do know that captured Africans, once they are brought into the wharf, were often in many cases held in these storehouses, awaiting their price to increase. So, if you're in Charleston, South Carolina, go and support, go check it out. Let us know what you think of it. A painting that is now described as being undoubtedly by Raphael go, is going on display in Bradford. This is going to be displayed at Bradford Council's Cartwright Hall Art Gallery for two months, starting on the 25th of July. This is following the university, a University of Bradford professor who researched this painting and identified it as being a Raphael. And it's been up for debate because it resembles the Sistine Chapel Madonna. Now they've used AI assisted computer based facial recognition to show that these paintings were identical to those in the famous altarpiece. American. Yes, so the yes, the the uh gem exhibition. People are asking if it's a Smithsonian exhibition. Ah, I 
also that's a good point as well. I I assumed that it was it was in much the same way as the um this is about the the gems exhibition. So in our free museums, so the British Museum is a free museum, VA, etc. But the is it not the case that the exhibitions, the special exhibitions like this, would incur a fee? It does also talk about um reserving tickets. It says it's included with general admission. So I'm assuming that general admission comes with a cost. This ticket price. If we just I'm just gonna hop back quickly. So it says here that the ticket price is included with general admission. So I'm assuming that this is an exhibition that's part of the paid ticket to come to the museum, the American Museum of Natural History. American Museum of Natural History. I'm going to see if I can find out how much they charge to enter. I should have checked this. I should have looked this up before. I apologise. I should have seen what it, the charge. So ticket prices are. Various, but between 18 and 20 pounds. Um, and it's it's not part of the Smithsonian. It's, I think it's a standalone institution. I, from what I can see, it doesn't seem to be tied to the Smithsonian. The Autry Museum in Griffith Park is doing an exhibition called Sherman Indian School, 100 Years of Education and Resilience. That's opening on the 23rd of July and is running until May 2024. If you get a chance to go and check this out, as with all of the exhibitions, please do let us know what you think of all of them, what's good. What, and if you see any other cool ones, let us know about that too. I do love talking about these uh, and, and sharing them. Now then, this is my friend's website, the lovely Philippa. If you if you follow British History Tour, if you follow, sorry, History After Dark, you will know Philippa very well. She is one of my co-hosts of History After Dark. This is her company. Now, why am I sharing this as the final part of our news updates? Well, friends, you are the first to know to watch this space, to make sure you know this, link this website. It's all linked. Go there because if you click on the tours you will see that in the tours list they've got all of the amazing tours that she runs that are all are sold out but there is one that is coming soon that I want to talk about and that is the Shakespeare in Stratford tour because this is going to be a British history tours run thing that I will be taking part in um, it's a weekend in Stratford I'm going to be the tour historian Philippa has, is putting together an incredible itinerary of going to see a play and going to the the birthplace sites and the schoolroom and uh, the place where Shakespeare is buried and just generally absolutely geeking out on Shakespeare and his history. Please do, if you're interested, um, go to her website and you can keep an eye on it we, I will be making more content about this the artwork is finished it looks incredible I'm so excited I'm so excited that that I'm getting to take part in this with her uh, and hopefully it, it goes well so do do keep your eyes peeled for that that is the end of today's news <laughs> it's we've been going for a while it's nearly three hours I'm I'm going to go and have some dinner now. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this. Please do make sure that you have liked, subscribed, click the bell icon. Um, please do leave comments. Please share the video and the channel. And I very much look forward to chatting with you in the live chat of the premiere for this Friday's video and also in our next news stream, which will be going in a fortnight's time. But I hope you can have a wonderful Monday, wherever your Monday is. And I hope that you're going to have a great week. 
going forward and that you are all going to have a brilliant time. And if you're too hot where you are, I saw at the start of the stream how warm it is. Stay cool. Take care of yourselves. I'm really looking forward to chatting you all again. Thank you ever so much for your support of this video and of my channel. But I'll speak to you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye for now.